Hey guys, Doom from the Geek Door here, and today I'll be bringing you my reaction to Ruby Fairy Tales Episode 3, titled The Shallow Sea. Ozpin recounts two distinct origin myths regarding the Faunus. So, this is addressing one of the things I had to say about this book in the first episode is that there are two stories that tell the exact same, well, story. That being the Shallow Sea and the Judgment of Faunus. I'm pretty sure. Because one tells it from the Faunus's point of view, and the other tells it from man's point of view. They're two fairy tales about the same event. And it seems like they've compiled those two stories into the same episode. So, I wonder what that's going to mean for this. Because I don't, I don't remember either one really well. Other than the fact that I know they're telling the same story. So, it's going to be interesting to see just how different... The tellings are. But I guess we'll find out when we get this started in three, two, one, go. Does also mean I've got to read two stories after this. Hmm. Interesting. Of course, a god would say that. Hmm. Fair. But when there's no humans left, what will the Grim feed on? Well, feed on.
Oh, it seems more passing judgment on man for the judgment of men. And fusion. Okay, not quite fusion. I thought it was going to fuse the two armies together, but... I mean, to be fair, humans with animal capability is superior. Fair enough. Okay, there wasn't really much to comment on with those. I feel like the actual title fable for this episode was not really focused upon in this episode. I feel like this one should have been called The Judgment of Men. Well, The Judgment of Man. And then sort of switched it around, had that at the start, and then told a more, like, optimistic view of it with the shallow sea at the end and then have Ozpiz narration over it. I feel like that would have worked better. So the first one basically these people they're not human they've got more animalistic tendencies than humans to put it um, lightly. Some they're wilder as souls than regular humans and so the god brings them to a place and he's like if you jump in this water your true self will be reborn basically it's a baptism being reborn as their true selves which is the faunus however some humans despite being basically the same as the people they've just seen baptized they won't accept them because of the differences from how they were brought up and everything and so they turned on it and were sent back to the lands of men whereas the other one is basically yeah humans are terrible and they wanted to um, control the animals the animals are fighting back out of self-preservation and because they know what humans will do if unchecked not just specifically to them but to everything so this god who is neither man nor beast comes together and just be like you know it'd be a lot better for everyone if you were a bit of each so yeah it seems i've got two stories to read through this time so I'll be back when I'm done with that. Okay, so I'll start by talking about the shallow sea, then come back again for the other one. It starts off saying, Long ago, before the fish had scales, the birds had feathers, and so on and so forth, when God still walked this earth, 
there were only humans and animals. And Grimm. There have always been Grimm, but they're not important to this story. Um, humans lived everywhere except for this one small island in the world. And then goes on to basically, for half a page, talk about the god of animals, how it can take any form it wants, and goes on to list various different combinations. And, yeah. However, the god of animals, who presided over this land, which only had animals, no humans, he eventually got bored and curious about the one thing he did not have on his island, that being human. However, he didn't want to run the risk of allowing humans free access to the island, so he went out and searched for humans who didn't really fit in with everyone else, whether that be for one reason or another, just they didn't feel like they belonged in society, so the god, posing as human, which he rarely did, went up to each of these people and said, leave, sail to the shallow sea, it's where you're meant to be. He arranged this big boat to stop at all the ports across Remnant and pick up all these people he's talked to and take them to the sea. And, well, he first gave them a tour around the island, showing them the harsh um, deserts, the animals, the variety of them, all living from shore to shore, and then finally stopped in front of what is basically a paradise, and tells them, um, this can be your home, if you want it, you're right, this is no place for mere humans, but you are no mere humans, if you jump from this boat and join me, you will see. Those with the strongest faith in this god of animals, who had revealed his true form to them, they jumped in the water without hesitation, and they instantly grew their animal traits, and they walked to the shore saying, this land's no more inhospitable than where we came from, but at least we can control our fates here, free from the constrictions placed on us by society, which emboldened more people to jump into the water, and they changed as they made their way to the shore. And then the final group said, they turned to the god, they're like, what have you done to them? So the people on the shore called out, they didn't do anything to us. The water hasn't changed us. It just washed away all the lies to reveal who we've always been, just under the surface. Our old forms were just a shallow disguise. This is who we are. Which emboldened a few dozen more people to jump off the boat, and they slowly transitioned. Because they lacked the faith, it was more of a process like it was to get them off the boat. And the final group, those who wouldn't jump, called the god a monster. And he said, you were my chosen, but you've disappointed me. Stay on the boat and return home. There is no place for you here. The sea revealed the shallowness of their thoughts without them ever stepping off the boat. And since that time, there has been humans, faunas, and animals on Remnant. And Ozpin's notes, um, there's not really thoughts on this story. It's more talking about how this is, uh, this was one of the more common stories told to faunas children, but it's never been written down by faunas or human prior to the inclusion in this book. And Osborn gave serious consideration as to whether to include it or not. But he then decided it does show a counter view to the judgment of Faunus, which is also in this collection. And so he felt it important to add. He says, if he 
overstep his boundary as a human in doing so. He asks for forgiveness and because he knows that this is deeply ingrained in the history of Faunus and he wishes to represent them among stories of Remnant as they are part of Remnant and says as Fauna stories are generally passed down from generation to generation, few outsiders ever hear them. And though he wants to show stories from all kingdoms and cultures, humans and Fauna alike, he says, that said, we must take care not to characterize the Shallow Sea as a mere story, for it is so much more for Fauna. I don't want to subject it to literary criti critiques, like I would the other tales in this story, well, other stories in this book. However, I will note that many humans and even faunas view this story as mere fantasy, a fanciful creation or myth, and even perhaps a dangerous one. Plus, in the aftermath of the Great War, when the faunas were gifted the island of Menagerie as this oasis away from humanity, where a small section of it is a paradise and a large swath of it is inhospitable desert, it just feels more like a kick in the teeth. And that is why it is no longer common, well, as common, for it to be told. And so another reason Ozpin wanted to put it in this book is so that it isn't forgotten to time. But yeah, there wasn't really much that wasn't transformed except for the start where it showed the god being bored or presiding over just animals and reaching out to the humans. There isn't really much. And I'll be back with the second story. I did miss one thing in telling about that story and that is Ozpin's final notes on that like the final narration is him saying that it is the descendants of those humans that turned away that still look upon the faunus with envy and that led leads to the discrimination we still see in modern society. So basically people like Cardin and that are descended from those people who turned away from the god and are envious of the freedom of the faunus. Okay, so again, this one was fairly faithfully translated, and it was actually supplied by Professor Leinhardt, which is surprising. But I guess, as Osborne said, faunus stories often do come from faunuses, so... Um... So, starts off pretty much the same way. Many, many years ago, in a far off land, there was a war between humans and animals. Humans envied animals because of what they could do. Run faster, jump higher, see in the dark, and have increased strength compared to what humans could do. And they weren't troubled by the grim. So, and this envy soon turned to hatred. Similarly, the animals envied humans because of the amazing things they could do. They could use dust, they could protect themselves with aura, they could adapt to situations, they could build complex structures and weaponry and machinery and all of that. All of that, and they persisted in the fact that the Grim were constantly after them. And this envy turned to fear. So... As the war raged on, casualties on both sides. At night, the animals would attack human settlements, taking what they could. And during the day, the humans hunted the animals. They were attacking from both sides. Until one such battle was interrupted by the arrival of the god. Who froze the battlefield, asked them why they were fighting, unfroze um, one from each side. And his voice, while neither English or animal, could be understood by both, but they could not understand each other. So when 
he asks them, why are they fighting? And they say, they are not like us. They don't know. They're saying the exact same thing as the other side. Only the God knows this. So why must everyone be the same? We worry about what they might do to us. So you have something in common. It's like, judge, judge not what others might do, but by what you see them do. So the animals say the humans are capable of destruction as they are with creation. Even is, evil is in their heart. The humans say animals are so much stronger than us, but they won't join us in the fight against Grimm. So we're like, have you even tried fighting together? The animals are like, yes, but the humans wanted to control us and make us their property. So they could use us to sacrifice our lives against the Grimm instead of their own. We just want to be free. It's not our fight. And the humans say, yes, but the animals are wild and unruly. They steal from us at night. We just wanted to keep them in their place so we may live in safety and peace. And so the gods are like, so you've grown to see the worst in each other. But you're alike. Your potential is unlimited if you can only learn to celebrate one another's best qualities and embrace your differences. I felt like that was pretty important to read almost verbatim. And so he looks between the two sides. He unfreezes the rest of the combatants who are very confused and stop fighting. He's like, I can end this conflict, but only if you all agree to my judgment. If you do not, if you agree, you will live in peace. However, if you don't agree, you will end up killing each other off and likely destroy the world in your process. So everyone considers it. The humans saw themselves in the God's speech and manners and were certain the God would, uh, would side with them. The animals saw themselves in the God's animalistic features, so they assumed that the God would side with them. And so everyone says, we choose life. We accept your judgment. The God's like, so be it. He sends out the fog which obscures everyone's vision, even those who could see in the dark. And everyone on that battlefield was worried that they were going to be attacked by the other side while this fog was rolled in. But when it dissipated, neither side remained. All that remained were the faunus. The animals had gained human features and stood upright on two legs, while the humans had gained animalistic features and enhanced senses. Though they all now looked alike, there were the differences in the animalistic traits and everything. It's like, what have you done to us? They called out to the gods. I thought the god was going to judge which of us was superior. Maybe they have. Were you? And then it's pretty much the exact same conversation they had in the show. Like, were you human or animal before? Doesn't really matter. If you look closely, you could tell who had been human because they were observing their new animalistic features and you could see who was the animal because they weren't steady on their um, feet like they hadn't been walking on two legs they were poking their new skin and they were naked it, which was also new to them because they felt embarrassment at the fact they were naked and just goes on to from comments from both sides talking about the new benefits they now have in their new forms. But unfortunately, that's not where the story ends because suddenly there's a pack of Grimm who sense the new heightened emotions from the battlefield and the confusion and everything afterwards and they attack. The new... The newly human ones, they weren't really... Well, at first they were unconcerned with the battle because the creatures of Grimm had never paid attention to them before. However, the Grimm don't distinguish between human and faunus. So 
they were unable to really defend themselves because they don't know the form and they don't know how to use aura and semblance and all of that. However, the humans, they adapted to the new strength and agility and all of that to defend them. Sure, there were losses and they needed to retreat because they couldn't kill all the Grim, but they were able to fight off for a bit. Eventually, they make it to the town and it's like, but the villagers wouldn't let them in. It's like, we lived here. Don't you remember us? We don't know you. So we don't trust you. Be gone. It's like, were we so narrow-minded as humans? Yes. And the forest had changed so much inwardly and outwardly so that they were no longer recognized but to them mothers and fathers, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters. In addition, they'd come to their village being pursued by Grimm, which the humans saw as a intentional attack. So the humans fled one way, looking for a new village to find, and the Faunus went off to find somewhere they could live peacefully with one another and become the best version of themselves. Since they were born, Faunus have never stopped running from Grimm and human, and searching for a place to call home. Um, Osborne's notes on this is like, Waller's story is as based in myth as the Shallow Sea is, it contains no less truth, and it's more surface level than in the Shallow Sea. While the former is a children's bedtime story, this is a adult's view on the world once they become enlightened to just the way things actually are. And it's like, unsurprisingly, Faunus always cast this god in the story as a wise figure who helped them settle their differences and made them the best they could be. Whereas the humans tell the story and they say that the god was a trickster. He cursed the people. And it's like... Um... Where was it? Which is rather telling, isn't it? And... Um, he also says, notably, many Fauna's fairy tales are open-ended. They rarely have something you'd call a happily ever after. In fact, most of them tend to have a bittersweet or downright depressing ending. How, however, it's like... Much of it reflects the Fauna's belief that their story is still unfolding and they have yet to discover their true purpose which is, in this story, to find somewhere where they can live and be free of prejudice and everything. Which is a sort of comforting notion in the fact that they don't see the state of the world as it currently is as the end goal. They are still the hope for a brighter future and everything. Which, I agree, that is a sort of comforting notion if... This is left open ended until they find that place. And yeah, I I still say the episode itself did have weird pacing issues and should have really been swapped around. But all in all, probably the best at getting its message across while keeping the story the same. Because, as I said, the first one, it missed the mark. I know what it is about the first one that missed the um, message. And that is because it doesn't have the final paragraph from the book, which is saying, whether out of thanks or consequences for what she had done, the Grimm had left her for last. That was an important piece that was not translated well. Whereas... Episode 2 obviously had big chunks taken out. You could say the same about the Shallow Sea. But you don't really need a description of the island, a description of the god. How the god viewed humans as um, too chaotic. Starting it in the middle of the story, having already collected all the people, 
while giving an expository nar narration about the fact that these people are different because they don't fit in, did work. So yeah, arguably I'd say this is, from a pure one-to-one -one translation, this is the best episode. And ironically, it's the one that had two fairy tales it needed to translate. But anyway, uh, I'm going to end this one here. I'll catch you in the next one.